Thanks for sticking around for the last uh, session of the day. Um, I'm, uh, my talk today is titled Protect Your Sensitive Bits. Uh, how to keep your data safe, if you're, especially if you're a developer writing a cloud service. Um, this might be pretty important to you. Uh, my name is Bob Wall. I'm the co-founder and CTO of a startup here. We're based here in Bozeman and in Boulder, Colorado called Iron Core Labs. Um, so, we're probably all pretty familiar by now with the fact that, that uh, in this day and age, data is really distributed all over the place. Um, we store our data in cloud services, um, whether we want to or not. I'm not sure if I wanted to. I could tell my phone to stop sending everything, every picture I take up to, to Google. Um, we use mobile devices to generate and consume data all the time. The Internet of Things is, again, whether we like it or not, generating data all over the place and sending it to places we're not even sure of. We, we ship our data to partners to process. We download data and generate data on employee laptops. And uh, a lot of these places are, are really not very well controlled, and they probably, a lot of them, don't have very good security. Um, so because of this, the, the models that we that we used to use back when I was a younger pup um, to keep data safe don't work anymore. You can't put all your data in a data center and build a big wall around it and then build another wall around that and then strengthen that wall because most of the places that need to access the data aren't in a place you can build a wall around. Um, so you can, you can and probably should put protections around your data center, but you're going to have to poke holes through the wall so that people can get to your data from where they want to use the, the data. Um, so because of that, you need to take some precautions that were not necessary previously to keep the data safe. And the conventional wisdom that, mo that you'll hear a lot now is that what you need to do is encrypt your data in transit and encrypt your data at rest. And, uh, um, I'm going to assume that everybody has at least a passing familiarity with encryption, so I probably I won't go into that. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about encryption in transit and encryption at rest, and um, while they might be good ideas, why they're not sufficient ideas to really protect your sensitive bits. Um, so I'll start with encryption in transit. Um, so so that just basically means that if you're shipping data over the series of tubes that is the internet or some other kind of network, that you encrypt it so that um, somebody who might be looking out there on the network that you don't know about can't just watch your data as it streams by. So what could go wrong with that? Um, so we'll start with an example. Um, I suppose at least some of you probably connected to the Wi-Fi here at uh, the Commons. And you probably, when you connected, were asked to use a, a password. Um, or you know anywhere else, a lot of places you go that you want to use the Wi-Fi, they'll have a, a, a password. And so they're probably using a protocol called WAP, WPA2 to protect your connection to the wireless access point from your Wi-Fi device. And so what this does, when you connect to the device, to the access point, when you enable Wi-Fi on your phone and you say, I want to connect to the commons access point, it starts up this protocol and the first thing it does is this handshake between the two and what that handshake does is it establishes an encryption key that it's <coughs> going to use subsequently to encrypt all the data going back and forth. And obviously you want that encryption key to be secret so Joe Hacker who's sitting over in the other room trying to spy on you can't, can't um, sneak a peek. So the handshake is just about generating a random encryption key and exchanging it between the two parties in a secure way. Um, so once that's established, you're going to use that key for all of the subsequent messages to encrypt them going both ways. So that sounds pretty good. We've got encryption in transit. Everything should be great. Um, well, it turns out not always. So some of you might have seen last year uh, vulnerability was found in WPA2 and uh, this, was, this was named the crack attack because any more if you don't come up with a catchy name for your vulnerability, you've just completely <laughs> failed. You know, that's... that's a lot of hard to Exactly. So, so CRACK stood for the key reinstallation attack. And unlike some other flaws that have been discovered in some of the protocols, this one wasn't about a particular implementation. It was actually 
a flaw in the way that they specified the WPA2 protocol. Um, it did get complicated because if any of you have ever read RFCs or other protocol specifications, a lot of times it's not really completely obvious what they mean when they say, you should do this, you must do this, maybe do this if the moon's full. Um, <laughs> and so, so there, was some, there were some things that they said to do in there that were not very, not very well thought out and they were um, additionally complicated by some, thing, some other things that were said that were up to interpretation. So it turned out that Wi-Fi clients that were used on mostly on Linux and Android um, were even more susceptible to this attack. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. But um, the way this attack worked, when this four-way handshake is going on between your device and the access point, if, if uh, Joe Hacker was sitting out there and was watching this process, they could capture the third message of the handshake, which was coming from the access point back to your phone. They just could capture it. And so this, this handshake is going on over radio, and you know all sorts of things could happen. There could be a lightning strike outside or something. So neither side in this process can assume that the other side got every message. So the protocol is set up to be tolerant to messages not being received. So there's a part of the protocol that says, if you get this message again, the same message again, specifically in this one, the third message of this handshake, you should reinstall your previous key and you, and you should reset this nonce value that's used in the encryption and that nonce value is to further randomize things. It's nonce stands for a number used once and they named that because you're not supposed to ever use that number twice with the same encryption key. So. The specification said you should reset the nonce and reinstall the old key. So if an attacker just recorded that message, waited until you got synchronized, sent a few messages back and forth, and then bam, just replayed it, dropped it on your device, the device would go, oh, I need to reset my session, reinstall that key, reset my nonce, start over, and then I start sending messages again, and because of the attack, and if the attacker could basically infer from that that you were sending the a message that they knew the plain text of, which you very well could do if you were trying to log in or something, they might be able to recover the, the key that would allow them to decrypt all of the messages that were going back and forth. Um, even better, on the Linux and Android operating systems, because of the way that they interpreted the specification, they just reset the encryption key to all zeros. So that made it really easy for you to guess what the encryption key was. So then your attacker is basically watching everything that's going back and forth between your client and the, and the um, access point. There is no encryption. There's encryption in transit that basically does absolutely nothing. So um, that's an example of where encryption in transit didn't really help. Um, so now let's move from working on a Wi-Fi network to the series of tubes out there on the internet. Um, and there predominantly encryption in transit means SSL secure socket layer. I'm sure you know everybody's familiar with that. And it works very similarly. Um, connection handshake creates a shared encryption key. Messages are encrypted using that key. And when it's a little bit different. In the handshake process, typically, one of the things that the, the um, server provides to the client is a certificate that's got its public key in it. And it's hopefully signed by someone that the client can trust to validate that that certificate's good. Um, so, so what are some of the things that can go wrong with SSL? Um, SSL's been around for a long time. Implementations have been around for a long time. Most of the implementations really suck. And so um, it's not hard, if you're setting up a server and you're turning on SSL, it's not that hard to misconfigure it. And one of the ways to misconfigure it is to set it up to use some really old protocols. So um, there are some old hashing protocols like MD5 was a hash that people used to use that um, you could crack in about three seconds on your cell phone probably now. Um, there were old encryption techniques that are still supported by SSL. If you, t if you misconfigure and turn on one of those, somebody captures the traffic, it might take them a few hours to, uh, to decrypt it, but you really want it to take a few years or more. So misconfiguration of SSL can cause a lot of problems. 
Um, another problem that's, that can be pretty difficult is a man in the middle attack. So if you go to a coffee shop, you fire up, you f say you're not using WPA2, you're just, it's wide open Wi-Fi, and you're like, ha, I'm too smart for this, I'm going to use SSL. I'm only going to visit HTTPS sites. Um, well, maybe the person who um, snuck out back where the Wi-Fi access point is connected to the internet was able to insert something that spoofed the DNS. So when you tried to go to your company's website with HTTPS, it instead sent it to their server. Their server pretends to be your website, establishes an SSL connection to your client, and then it establishes an SSL connection to your server, just like it was the client on your phone, and it basically, every time you send a message, it decrypts it, re-encrypts it, and sends it up. So, um, you know, it, it's seeing everything going back and forth. Um, luckily, this can be thwarted pretty easily if that certificate that I talked about is there, and if your client validates that certificate. Um, part of the certificate is the domain, and certificates issued by a responsible certificate authority should require you to prove that you control the domain that you're getting the certificate for. So you can't go and say, I'm Google, would you give me a cert that I can sign and say, you know, HTTPS www.google.com is me. So um, if, if you make sure to have certs that are signed, you can avoid man-in-the-middle attacks. And so you can go buy a cert from a certificate authority if you're a startup and running on the cheap. Instead of doing that, you can get free certs from Let's Encrypt. It's a relatively new place that's handing out these free certificates. Better yet, they will generate new ones. You can set it up so that you can get a new one every three months. And they've got an automated process to do that, which is kind of nice. <coughs> um, so you definitely, if you're, if you're running a website, you should be using SSL because even if you don't have sensitive data, you probably don't want somebody to be able to hijack your traffic to your website and impersonate you and put up all manner of terrible things. So um, some of the other things that can go wrong with, open SS, with SSL are similar to the things that could go wrong with WPA2. It's software, and software has bugs. Um, SSL, this, these numbers are a couple years old, but um, two-thirds of the websites were using OpenSSL, which is an open source implementation. Um, and this is a graph of some of the vulnerabilities that have been detected in OpenSSL over the years. And so you might have heard two or three years ago about Heartbleed and uh, Drown and Freak and Logjam. These were some of them were very significant, very serious vulnerabilities that were found in OpenSSL, kind of along the lines of the crack attack, where people might be able to recover the key that was used for an SSL connection and decrypt the traffic. So this is not a guarantee. It, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be using SSL. You absolutely should. But you shouldn't assume that because you're using it, um, you're not going to have a vulnerability where somebody might be able to get at your data. Another option, this is kind of SSL on steroids, is using virtual private networks. Um, a virtual private network is sort of like an SSL connection, except it's a tunnel that you can route multiple connections through. So you basically set up a tunnel going from your client to a VPN server, and that VPN server, maybe it's inside of your corporate network. Maybe it's just out there on the web. So if you want to travel, say, to China, and you get there and you would like to be able to Google things that the Chinese government would rather you not be able to Google, you might be able to connect to one of the public VPN servers in the US. So there's this tunnel that gets created from you to the VPN server and everything, and then so nobody can see what's going through that. It's just an encrypted stream of random bytes. Um, you might not be able to do that because China might not let you create VPN connections either because they don't want such an obvious workaround. But, VPNs can be a, an option, too, for encrypting in transit. Um, so, so those are some reasons why uh, encrypting in transit is not the be-all, end-all. And at some point, encrypting in transit means you come out the other end of the tunnel, and you're somewhere where the data is going to have to go. And so then you move into the next piece of the conventional wisdom is encrypting at rest. And uh, so what's encrypting at rest good for? Um, if you have a laptop or a mobile phone, encrypting at rest is an awesome idea. You should definitely turn on full disk encryption on your laptop. 
Um, when you log in, you'll you typically, like on my MacBook, the same password that I used to log in um, basically unlocks a secret key that's used to encrypt every disk block. The overhead is not noticeable. And if I somehow, if I am going through security in an airport and my bag makes it through ahead of me and somebody was following me and they grab my laptop and take off, they pry the, la the hard drive out of it or the solid state drive, they're not going to be able to decrypt it. Um, so it's, it's a great idea for your, for your mobile devices. Um, your phones probably have uh, encryption on them to protect the uh, non-volatile memory in the phone. So yeah, you should do that. But when you move this up to a cloud service and talk about what does encryption re at rest protect there, it protects against forklift attacks. <laughs> now, a forklift attack is where somebody takes a bomb, blows a hole in the wall of your data center, drives a forklift in, lifts up a rack of disks, and drives off with them, and then takes them apart and tries to recover the data. So if you've got all of your disks encrypted, well, they're not going to be able to get anything from them. Well, maybe not. Maybe they got lucky and they grabbed the disk that had the keys for all of your other encryption on it. And so if the key is sitting on top of the desk and you used it to lock the desk drawer, you didn't gain very much. You thwarted only the stupidest attackers. So um, encryption at rest is pr of dubious use. Um, and we can think about some of the data breaches in the last few years. In 2015, there was an Anthem data breach. They, they leaked a lot of information. It turned out that um, they didn't encrypt their data at rest. But it also turned out that most of the analysts I read said it probably would not have mattered. Because the way they got in, they compromised the credentials of at least five different employees of the company. And, and they figured that at least one of those um, employees would have had access that would let them get the keys to decrypt the disks that had the data, if it had been encrypted at rest. Um, Another reason that encryption at rest is a problem is that it turns out the Department of Homeland Security did a study at, around that same year, and they found that of all the security vulnerabilities, 90% of them were actually caused by problems in the application rather than problems in the network. So it wasn't that the firewall that was protecting the data center had a fly in it. It was almost always because the application that was exposed through the firewall had a problem in it. So we can think about last year, the Equifax data breach, which probably a lot of you heard about. They lost data for 150 million customers. That might actually be more. And it was breached because they were running some applications in Apache Struts. And Apache Struts turned out to have a vulnerability that let somebody send some stuff to it that it interpreted and executed as code. And then somebody sent some data to it that let them access the servers and exfiltrate this huge amount of data. Um, it turned out, cautionary tale, um, the patch for that vulnerability had been published two months before the attack happened. And so um, the people at Anthem took a lot of grief because they weren't keeping up on their patching. If, if they had installed that patch, they wouldn't have suffered that breach. Um, and you know, it's easy to be outraged at them. And if any of you have worked in a, in a um, company that supports any kind of cloud service, how many of you are keeping up on your patches within two months? I know I worked at right now and uh, we were not keeping up at that time with our patches on a two month <laughs> schedule or even close. So, um, you know, there's just a lot of opportunity there. So, so encryption at rest, um, because of the vo app application vulnerability, even things like SQL injection attacks, which are a lot less exotic than a vulnerability in struts. The application, almost by definition, has to have the keys to get at the data in the database or it can't do its job. So as soon as there's a vulnerability in the application, even though the data is encrypted, it gets decrypted and sent out. So encryption at rest doesn't really gain you very much. Um, you probably should still do it. Um, you never know when the forklift's going to roll through the wall of the data center, but um, it's not a it's not a cure all by any means. Another reason, if you're doing cloud services, that that it, that these two things might not be sufficient is, if you're a customer of a cloud service, the question comes up about how much can you really trust your service provider? Um, 
So there, there can be a lot of privacy concerns. For example, I worked at right now, we were purchased by Oracle. And after, after we were purchased by Oracle, Oracle had a, a very firm policy that you should never use any of the Google Cloud services for anything. Um, it turns out that seemed like a little draconian. In light of the lawsuit that Oracle had against Google, you might, you might start to see some of the wisdom of that. It's like, okay, yeah, the lawyers were um, preparing these, these documents and they stored them on Google, Google Drive. Well, Google's got the keys for all of that data somewhere. And so whether they're snoop, snooping through Oracle's documents to find out things about lawsuits, or if they're just indexing them to like, better target search, you might not want Google going through your data, or Amazon, or Microsoft. So, so you might have a concern about that. And even if you trust Google, or Microsoft, or Dropbox, um, if they can get at your data, then the government can probably drop in on them with a subpoena and say, hey, we'd like you to get at their data too. And uh, maybe, you, maybe you're never going to be doing anything where this becomes an issue, but you might prefer that if the government wanted to subpoena data, that they would have to come to you instead of going to your service provider. And if they show up at Google's door with a subpoena, and a gag order, you might not ever even know about it. So, so these, these security concerns and privacy concerns are another reason why um, cloud services are having some problems and why encryption in transit and, and encryption at rest aren't really enough of a solution. So where can you go from there? What is the answer? Well, maybe a big part of the answer is basically encrypt all the way through. Um, use end-to-end -end encryption where you know, if you've got some device, it's a browser, a mobile phone, a tablet, an IoT device that's going to generate some data that you want to keep secure, encrypt the data on the device. So, in, like, if you're encrypting something that you want a specific person to access, say, if, 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 they, have a, if they can use public key cryptography, meaning they can have a public key that they can put out there and anybody can look at, you can use that to encrypt data to them. They've got a private key that goes with that that they can, only they can use to decrypt the data. Use their public key, encrypt the data on the device, then send it to the cloud provider. It doesn't matter if somebody breached the SSL connection, if they breached the application and scraped that encrypted block out of the database, um, they're not going to be able to read it. And then when it gets to the device of the person that you're sending it to, they take their private key and decrypt it. Then the only place that you have a vulnerability is you know, if they store that document on that device and they drop the device and somebody picks it up, there's not very much you can do about that. But otherwise, it's pretty well secured and pretty well independent of most vulnerabilities. There's, you know, there's still the possibility that you just really chose a really poor algorithm to do the encryption. But barring that, you know, it, it provides you a lot better degree of certainty. End-to-end um, -end encryption is starting to gain a lot of traction for, for a lot of these reasons. So these are some companies now that um, you might have heard of. You might, I have Signal installed on my phone. It's an encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app. Um, WhatsApp is also the same thing. Telegram, pretty much the same thing. Wicker provides end-to-end um, -end encrypted messaging and voice and a couple of other things. ProtonMail is an end-to-end -end encrypted email solution. Um, so, so these, these applications are starting to gain some popularity. People are becoming a little bit more aware of this issue and starting to want those things. Um, you'll kind of notice a common theme in these is that they're really all focused on basically person-to-person -person channels, uh, messaging or email. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's that if you want to do something where you're encrypting to a, a large group of people, especially a large and dynamic group of people, um, that's problematic. Uh, so I don't know if anybody's familiar with using GPG. Um, it's a, it's a kind of, it's been around for quite a while. It's a public key encryption tool. Um, and if you wanted to use GPG to encrypt a file and you wanted to encrypt it to several people, um, you'd get the public key of each of the people that you wanted to encrypt it to, and you'd feed those public keys and that file into this program and <coughs> spit out this thing that was encrypted to each of those people. And, and when we're talking about public key encryption, 
I mean, it's, it's important to, I don't know how important it is, but I had 45 minutes to fill up here, so I'm going to go into some of this very detail. Um, we're, we're not actually taking the whole file and encrypting the whole file with each of those people's keys, because public key encryption is slow. So what we really do is we take the file and we use symmetric key encryption, which is a lot more common and a lot faster. So we generate a random key for a symmetric encryption algorithm, like AES is a popular and very secure one. We encrypt the file with that AES key, and that was very fast. And then we take the AES key and we use it as data, and we encrypt that thing, which is small and, and fast to encrypt, with each of those public keys. So if we wanted to encrypt a document to Alice and Bob, we'd get each of their public keys, we'd generate this AES key, encrypt the data, we'd encrypt the, it, that random key with Alice's key and with Bob's key, and then we'd create this envelope that's got kind of these two addresses that we stick on it, and then we tuck the encrypted AES file inside of it, and that's the thing that we deliver. And then when Alice or Bob gets it, they grab the address that's appropriate for them, they can decrypt it using their private key, then they take that key and decrypt what's inside of it and they can recover the document. So that sounds pretty good and that's not too hard to do. Now suppose you encrypted one of those and you left it out on Dropbox. Then you're like, oh, well yeah, I, wanted, I want to also make it so Carol can, use that, can open that document too. Well, okay, with GPG that means that you basically go and decrypt the file and so that means that Alice or Bob has to do this. They go and decrypt the file using one of their keys, and then they re-encrypt it using their two keys plus Carol's key. Okay, that was not fun, but not terrible. Now suppose the next day, Diane joins the group and they want to encrypt it to her. So, you know, you can do this, but at some point it obviously doesn't scale well. And if you have large groups of people and they're very dynamic, it really doesn't scale well at all. So, um, there's, there's, Hopefully there's a better way to do that. Um, now I'll enter the, sh the uh, shameless plug part of the program. Um, <laughs> we, we are working on better ways to do that. And so um, we wanted to build an, a system that we call orthogonal access control system. Um, all that means it's a fancy name for something where a user gets to pick the groups that are going to be able to access the data. And independently or orthogonally to that, Group administrators get to decide who's in the group. They can add members, they can remove group members to the groups. They can do that independently. Um, so that in and of itself is nothing new. There are a lot of access control systems that do that. The, the Unix group membership thing does that, right? You can say this group, can, this file can be read by the sysadmin group, and then you can go and say who's in the sysadmin group, and then later they can go retrieve that file. What we wanted was something that was actually backed by cryptography instead of backed by policy. Um, turns out that's a little harder to do. And we wanted something so that you could make changes to group membership, you could grant access to files, revoke access to files to members of the group, and all of those things would be constant time in operations that didn't depend on the number of users, the number of groups, or the number of documents that were managed by the system. Um, so like I said, that that is a little harder nut to crack. Um, and we found a way to do that that uses uh, uh, techniques called proxy re-encryption. Um, this has been around for 15 years or so. And these proxy re-encryption algorithms are a set, basic, actually a set of algorithms that kind of go together. Um, they're based on public key cryptography. Um, they were originally designed to allow the recipient of the encrypted messages or documents to basically delegate access to those to someone else without giving that someone else their secret key. So suppose, suppose we had an email system like ProtonMail where every user of the system had a, a public and private key pair and <clears throat> the public keys were all stored so that you could get at them. There's a directory of public keys. And um, any, you know, so you could send encrypted messages to anybody using their public key and they could decrypt them. Now suppose that you Suppose Alice is one of the people that's using this and she's getting encrypted emails and she wants to go on vacation. And while she's on vacation, she wants to delegate access to her emails to Bob because it's always Alice and Bob. If, you have, if you're not familiar with crypto, my apologies, but it's always Alice and Bob and Carol and Dave. 
And so um, she wants to let Bob look at her emails while she's on vacation, but she doesn't want to give me her, public, her private key because when she gets back, she hopes she still has a job and she can resume that. And she doesn't want me to keep peeking at her emails forever or until she gets a whole new key. So she wants to delegate that access temporarily. And so while she's gone, the mail server will get her emails. They'll make them so that Bob can decrypt them. And then when she gets back, she can just say, stop doing that. And um, so that's what proxy re-encryption was designed for. And proxy re-encryption schemes pretty much all come with these five pieces or primitives. Um, they've got something to do key generation. So this is very much like PGP, GPG, public and private key generation. You get a key pair. They've got a transform key generation, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. There's something to encrypt to somebody's public key. So this is very similar to what GPG does. There's a process to do transformation that I'll talk about some more. And then there's a decryption process where you can decrypt an encrypted message or a transformed message and, and recover it using your private key. So transformed key generation basically requires the person that wants to delegate access to get their private key and the public key of the person that they want to give the access to. And they put those things together into this algorithm. It computes this transformed key and it sends it to this proxy server. Um, so in, in our example, that would maybe be the email server. So it gets this transform key. Now, suppose while, while Alice is on vacation, an email comes into the email server. The email server has this transform key that Alice created from her to Bob. It, the proxy sees this message. It takes the transform key. It uses this transform operation from the proxy re-encryption algorithms to change the message so that it's no longer encrypted to Alice. It's encrypted to Bob. It sends the mail to Bob. He opens it, he's got a private key that'll unlock it. Now, in this process, the proxy didn't have Alice's private key, so it never decrypted the message. It never saw the, the plain text that was sent. Um, it could only transform the message so that it looked like it was encrypted to Bob. It got no information about the message. It also didn't have any way to find out any information about what Alice's secret key was. It can't take that transform key and beat it with a hammer 20 times and say, oh, Alice's secret key was one, two, three. Um, so it turns out that, uh, that these proxy re-encryption schemes let us build this orthogonal access control system that we wanted to build. Um, pretty simply, we just introduced the concept of a group. And so if, if we build a system that lets people create groups and encrypt documents to groups, and then to add members to groups, as soon as we add a member to a group, um, it will let that member now decrypt any document that was encrypted to the group or will be encrypted to the group. So again, that's the orthogonal part of the access control. They can happen independently in time. And we can remove members from group, and as soon as we do, they, can't, they can no longer decrypt documents that are encrypted to that group. So um, the, the operation of creating a group is basically just creating a public key and private key pair for the group. So you just call the key generation from the re-encryption algorithm and you're done. Um, to keep things secure, we take the group's private key. So, you know, private keys need to be protected. We encrypt the private key with the public key of the user that created the group. And basically that means that that user is now the administrator of the group. They have access to the private key, which means that they can use that to add new members to the group. Anybody that has access to the private key, we'll see in a couple slides, can add people to the group. So once we've got the group created, we've got a public-private key pair. We maybe put the public key out there on some sort of directory server. Maybe the proxy is also the directory server. If somebody's got a document and they want to give access to that document to that group, all they do is uh, get the group's public key and just encrypt the document to that group. Um, and now they don't need to know who's in the group, who's going to be in the group, who's going to stop being in the group tomorrow because, well, they weren't quite working as hard as they should. Um, they, they have that simple operation to do. Now, an administrator can add a member to the group by just creating a transform key. They have, by, by definition, the administrator knows how to get at the group private key. They get the public key of the user that they want to encrypt to. They create a transform key, save that on the proxy. Now, that user has a way 
to take any document that was encrypted to the group and transform it so it's encrypted to them and can be unlocked with their own private key. So that, that shows here. And like, you'll notice that these, doc, these things look pretty similar to the diagrams that I had for just generic proxy re-encryption. Yeah, that's because we're not doing anything on top of it, really. We're just using it to implement this orthogonal access control idea. Um, if we want to remove a member from the group, all we have to do is tell the proxy, hey, that transform key from that group to that member, just throw it away. And as soon as it's gone, the, the proxy is not able to transform it. The user that we remove from the group doesn't have the group's private key, so they can't decrypt the messages. So their access is revoked. And you don't have to trust that um, this is done by a policy that's implemented correctly. It's done by math. And so, you know, that's why we wanted a, a cryptographically backed method. So you know that once you've done this, that user is not going to be able to decrypt that group's documents in, again. Um, so that gives us our basic orthogonal access control system, cryptographically backed, that we wanted. Um, turns out that there are a couple things about that that, were, that we really didn't like that much. And one of them is that it turns out Users aren't going, you know, I don't have this little plug in my head that keeps my private key and talks to servers and stuff. I'm using some kind of device to do that. Maybe it's my la a browser on my laptop, my phone, my tablet. And so I would really, really prefer to not have to copy my private key around between my different devices. Because right now my SSH keys that I use to access GitHub, if I want to use two boxes, I've got to, oh, i got to copy that key over there. And, I better do it in that's some way that somebody can't snoop on. And so um, that's not the best experience. So we wanted to be able to avoid that. And one way to do that is basically add a second level of delegation. So from the user, we add another level of delegation to the device that's, that that user authorizes to access data for them. Um, that way, the device private keys can always stay on the device. And uh, in browsers, that's not a thing, but uh, if you're using a, a mobile device, a lot of them have um, a secure enclave or something, a, a secure place that you can store those private keys. So the device private key stays on the device. If you happen to drop your iPhone somewhere and somebody picks it up and you use 1111 for your passcode, um, as, soon as, you did, as soon as you realize that you dropped your phone, you can revoke access to that device just by forgetting that transform key. And you don't, you know, that device is no longer able to access your data. Um, so to do that, to implement that, we actually needed a special type of proxy re-encryption called multi-hop. That just means that, you know, we we already talked about the fact that you could take a, a document encrypted A, then transform the key from A to B, and create a document that looks like it's transformed to B. And so B could decrypt it, but with a multi-hop PRE algorithm. You could take that encrypted document, that transforms document, and a transform key from B to C, and you could transform it an additional time so that now C could decrypt it. So we can have multiple levels of, re of transformation. And once we have that, we can create a system where we've got groups, we've got users, and then we've got devices. And so we can, we can apply a string of transformations so that a device can access something. Um, Adding a device is just like adding a member to a group. You just compute a transform key from the user to the device. Um, then when a device wants to access a document, it asks the proxy, it's like, hey, I've got this encrypted document. I need to be able to decrypt it. And the proxy says, huh, I wonder how I can give that access to that, from, to that document, to that device. There might be a couple ways. Maybe the, maybe the document was encrypted to that user. So then I've got to transform from that user to the device that the user authorized. I can just apply that transform. Or maybe it was shared with a group that has a user that approved that device. So then I've got two transforms. One way or another, I find the shortest path and I just apply those transforms in order, return the document, and the device can encrypt it, can decrypt it with its private key. So now I've got scalable end-to-end -end encryption. Um, I can handle arbitrarily large groups of users. When I add a user, remove a user from a group, I don't have to go and find all the documents that are encrypted to that group and go peel pieces out of the, out of the wrapper. Um, I don't have to go edit a bunch of data, which is the way that most systems that use um, 
encryption now have to do it if they're working with groups. Um, granting and revoking access is a constant time operation, and I don't need to copy private keys all over the place. Um, so, you know, those seem to be pretty useful features. Um, an interesting application of this, we think, is actually to um, GDPR. And I'm sure most of you have probably gotten about 5,000 emails in the last couple of weeks because of this general data protection regulation that just went into effect in Europe. And what that says, it, it's got a bunch of requirements about privacy and security of data for consumers. And some of them include the right to, of consent, which means you should, you should have to tell companies it's okay for them to use your data. You should be able to review the data that companies have about you. And the, the particularly sticky one is you should be able to tell companies, I want you to forget my data. And that last one is the real bear. Um, so suppose you're running a cloud service and you're gathering data and um, you're really careful about the data and you make sure you don't put any user's private information in logs or any of the stupid things you see in the news. But you know, you've got backups and maybe you, you're old school, you still back up to tape and you take those tapes off to some vault somewhere once a month. Well, three years from now, some user says, hey, I want you to forget about me. It's like, well, there's three years worth of backup tapes in a vault somewhere. Are you going to pay somebody to go and, and trace through all of those and delete that data? Well, you'd probably rather not. So we think that you could use PRE to, to protect that data. And, and what it requires is, is uh, like a simplistic version of this is if you, if you took the user's data while you were gathering it, and if the user had a public key, you could encrypt the data to that user's public key. And so, at that point, the only thing that can be done with that data is that user can decrypt it and look at it, which gives you the right of review. But then the user can, can, grant right, can grant consent to say, this company can use my data just by tr creating a transform key from their key to a public key of the company. Once they do that, the company then, maybe that's a group and they can have different members of that group, and we can use proxy re-encryption to allow anybody who belongs to that group to access that user's private data. Um, so, so we've got the right to consent, we've got the right of review, and then at some point in the future if the user decides, hey, I don't want this company to keep using my data, they can just tell the company, delete that transform key. <coughs> now, you have to trust that the company will at least do that when you tell them to. But if they do, that data, even, even if they took that data and put it on backup tapes, or if they put that data in log files that they outsourced to some logging company, that data is basically inert once that transform key is gone. So you've got the right to be forgotten without actually having to go find the data and erase it. You've rendered it inert, which we're pretty confident meets the requirements. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so, you know. But, but we think that this could be a pretty elegant solution to some of the GDPR problems. Um, so this, this proxy re-encryption stuff is not, for some reason, hasn't been really popularly adopted. So when we decided this is what we wanted to do, what's the next thing you do? You go to GitHub and you find an implementation of it, right? Um, <laughs> well, we went to GitHub and we came up with nothing. So we wrote our own, we implemented the PRE primitives, we implemented them in Scala. Um, we used Scala.js to basically produce a JavaScript version of the library. It's not the fastest code that you've ever seen. Scala.js works, but um, you know, we've be definitely got a lot of room for optimization, but we've actually got this from the same code base to run in Scala on the server <coughs> and run in JavaScript on the client. Um, the library is open source if you're if you're morbidly curious or really want to screw up a weekend, um, look at a crypto code. Um, you can just look at Core Lab slash recrypt on GitHub. Um, we've got a working system built around this. We built a JavaScript SDK on top of it. Uh, the SDK talks to a service that serves the transformation proxy and the public key repository and everything. Um, that part isn't open source, but we do have free signups. If you, if you want to just see what you can do with this technology, um, you, you can uh, sign up for free, play around with it. There's a getting started tutorial at docs.ironcurtlabs.com where you can, it just kind of, you don't have to sign up to use it. It'll just show you how, how it works in an, in an application or web app. Um, with that, 
any questions? <laughs>